Welcome to Palm Sunday service here at Mount of Olives Church. We're glad you could join us. We pray God blesses you richly as you do. We are so glad you could be a part of these services online. And we are remaining in touch with many through phone calls and through emails and through our Facebook page. And so we hope that you'll participate with us there as well. I'm writing a daily devotional, and if you're not getting it, you can go on our website and find them there, moochurch.org, or you can give us your email address on our website and let us know that you'd like to receive them. There's also a communication card that you can use today and uh, let us know that you are a part of what we're doing. And just email that back to us through our website, moochurch.org, M-O-O church.org. And we continue to need your financial support. It is vital in these days. Uh, we have cut thousands of dollars in our budget, but there are certain things you just can't cut if you're going to continue to do ministry, even in the way in which we're doing it now. So we really need you. We really need your support, and we hope that you'll give it to us. Uh, if you'd like to know how to give electronically, you can go to your bank and they'll help you do it directly, and then there will be no fee. If you go on our website, we can help you there too. And so we hope that you'll continue to give us your support. We really need it at this time. So may God bless you on this Palm Sunday. Let us continue now with our worship. Lord, speak to us that we may speak in living echoes of your tone. As you have sought to let us seek your straying children lost and lone. Oh, lead us, Lord, that we may lead the wandering and the wavering feet. Oh, feed us, Lord, that we may feed your hungering ones with manna sweet. Oh, teach us, Lord, that we may teach the precious truths which you impart, and wing our words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. Let us join together as we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I sure have missed meeting together in one room to worship. And I've really missed meeting with the Mount of Olives Choir and rehearsing on Thursday nights and also leading worship on Sunday mornings. So I guess the next best thing was to cull through the archives and try to find a song of hope to uh, encourage us this Sunday morning. And this next song does just that. It was recorded a few years ago and it's provided a lot of hope for many people over these past few years. It revolves around the truth that when God is in it, there's no limit.
Join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, what a blessing it is to have the assurance that you are with us in all circumstances. Help us with our faith. Help us to rely completely upon you. Grant us spiritual perception to see your presence in our lives and grant us wisdom as we chart our course in these precarious, uncertain times. We know that you will never leave us or forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 55, 8-9 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Here ends the reading. This is Palm Sunday, and we're glad we can be together, even if it is online, to celebrate the beginning of Holy Week. And I believe that Palm Sunday has a lot to say to our lives in this season of the coronavirus. And we're going to look at that in just a few minutes. But as we do, I want to refresh us as to what really happened on that first Palm Sunday. You can read about it in your Bible. It's, on, it's in every gospel, particularly in Matthew chapter 21 and Mark chapter 11. So we hope you'll go there and read the story of Palm Sunday. It's a story that happens towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's a story that happens just days before the cross on Golgotha. Jesus is riding on a donkey triumphantly through the city of Jerusalem. People are taking palm branches down off the trees and waving them at him and crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People are laying down their garments on the road as he passes by. And they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's great excitement. There's great celebration. There's great joy. So how is it then that just a few days later, many of those same people would cry out before Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. What happened between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Well, it was a major misunderstanding. The crowd had one expectation and Jesus had another purpose. The crowd's expectation was that when the Messiah would come, they would bring, he would bring a revolution. You see, they were under the authority of Rome. They were an occupied people. They were under the government of Rome. We can imagine what it would be like in our own land if we had another country calling the shots and making the decisions and holding us accountable to a foreign country. Rome was controlling them. And they believed that when the Messiah would come, he would bring about a revolution that would overthrow Rome, a coup d'etat. And even if it had to be violent, that's what the Messiah would do. And so they're looking for this moment and they're, they're believing that now is the time. They've been hearing about Jesus up in the northern part of the country over the last three years. They've heard about the miracles. They've heard the claims of being a Messiah. And now he's in Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. They put two and two together and they believe the revolution has started. They were not alone in that thought. The early disciples of Jesus had the same idea. At one point in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says, a day is coming, it's very soon, when I will be, have to suffer under the religious leaders and the governmental leaders. I will be tortured, I will die, and I will be raised again on the third day. Peter pulls him aside and says, Lord, this must never happen to you. And Jesus rebukes him and says, you're not obeying God, but men. And so there was a big misunderstanding. They thought that when the Messiah would come, he would bring a revolution. See, what often happens in their life and in ours is that we think we know what God ought to do. And so we think we know what he should do and when he ought to do it, and when he should do it. And so we have certain expectations. But Jesus would say, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my soldiers would have come to fight. And so while they may have had one understanding, Jesus had a different plan, God's eternal plan. You see, what happens so often in our lives is we become critical of God. We think we know what he ought to do. We think we know what he should do. And we think we know when he ought to do it. You know, it kind of reminds me of that movie. Do you remember the movie, Bruce Almighty? Jim Carrey played the role of a news reporter by the name of Bruce Nolan. And Bruce Nolan was highly critical of God. He said that God was like a mean kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass who would just shine the sun down on the ants and kill them. He said, God can help us, but he's like that mean kid with the magnifying glass. He's only there to hurt us. Well, Morgan Freeman plays the part of God and he encounters Bruce Nolan and he says, you know, Bruce, you've been awfully critical of me, awfully judgmental of me, and I'm getting a little tired of it. So I'll tell you what, 
I want you to run the world for a little while and see how you do. Well, Bruce was happy to do it, but it didn't take long for Bruce to realize that he couldn't handle it. Just the prayers alone were suffocating. He couldn't keep up. Hundreds of thousands of prayers every second, every moment. Finally, at one point in the movie, he just pushes the yes word to answer all those prayers. Yes. 400,000 people won the lottery in that moment. The only trouble was it was only worth $17 a person. See, so often we can be critical of God. We think we know more than he does. We think he ought to do it the way we see it. That we know what he ought to do. We know what he should do. And we have a timeline for him to do it. But God doesn't look at it like that. God sees things a little differently. The prophet Isaiah speaking on God's behalf, God is speaking through him through the power of the Holy Spirit, says these words in Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight and nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God has a different plan. God knows what's really best for us, and his timetable is never late. Did you notice on that story of the Palm Sunday that the crowd was shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? The word Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. Not just save us, but save us now. What were they really saying? God, we know when we need to be saved. We know what the timeline ought to be. Save us now. Perhaps we're in that season right now with the coronavirus. We think, God, why are you so late? Why aren't you acting? Why aren't you engaged and involved? We're critical of him. We don't think his timeline is right. And we too are saying, save us now. But God has a plan. The almighty everlasting God has a plan. And his timeline is always right. He's never late. It kind of reminds me of a man who was out on his front driveway and he noticed one of his neighbors had a box, a big, large box at the end and the edge of his pickup truck. So he thought he'd be neighborly and he'd go over and help him. And he quickly found that the box was very heavy and very large and he kept struggling with it. And finally he said to the owner of the truck, this is so heavy and so big, I don't think we'll ever get it on this truck. And the owner of the truck said, get it on the truck. He says, I'm trying to get it off the truck. <laughs> Isn't that what we do with God sometimes? We think we have a plan that'll work and he ought to take our leadership and our ideas and follow through with what it is we want to do. No, he says, my ways are higher than your ways. My plans are higher and different. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He says, my ways are different. It's just that we don't always want to submit to that, is it? Well, sometimes we've got to stop and just reflect on the realization that God is almighty. He is everlasting. He's got a plan and he's got a schedule and he's always on time. You know, during this season, I've been asking the question each week, what is God going to do during this time? How is God going to use this corona pandemic? Now, I don't mean that he caused it. I don't mean he started it because he is the author of life, not death. He doesn't bring sickness. He only brings life. He brings healing. He brings restoration and renewal. So he didn't cause it, but the Bible does teach us that he can take bad things and turn them into something good. So what is it that he wants to do through this season? How is he going to use it? One of the things I've been doing in this season is to think about the figures of history that have gone before us. People who have suffered, sometimes even more greatly than we. And I've asked myself, what did they do? How did they survive? How did they find solutions? What was their attitude and what was their outlook? How did they frame those moments in their life? One such name that comes to mind is that of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II. And he saved the country from being run over by the Nazis and Hitler. 
He was first elected to the parliament when he was 33 years of age in 1900. And he was a rising star. He became what we would call the undersecretary of the Navy during World War I. But he made some bad decisions during that season. During that time in the Dardanelles and in other places, he made some bad decisions and he was exiled from that moment on. His star was no longer rising. He was being forgotten. He was being ignored. In fact, he was being ridiculed and laughed at. And for the next 30 years, Winston Churchill was ignored and forgotten and lived a political exile in a political desert. Well, over the last 10 years of that period, he saw the rise of Hitler and the Nazis in Europe. And he began to be a prophetic voice. No one would listen. No one paid attention. No one took him seriously. Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of England, tried to establish peace with Hitler. He even went and met with him in Munich and developed the Munich Pact and came back to Britain and said, we have peace in our time. Unfortunately, it didn't last. Hitler was not a man of his word. He was an evil man. And he started invading other countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia. Neville Chamberlain had to resign as prime minister. And now they turn to the prophetic voice. They turn to the voice of Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill became prime minister of England in 1940 at the age of 65. Many people look at the history of that time and say that he was the indispensable man. Without him, and perhaps without Franklin Roosevelt, the war could not have been won. That he was the man who rallied the troops. He was the man who rallied the spirits. He was the man who had the plan and knew how to put it into place. Many have looked at that season in history and time and said that it was as if God had his hand on Churchill and used him to defeat the Axis powers and the evil that Nazism represented. But that's not what I want to talk about today. He was victorious. He had a mighty victory, Churchill did. But that's not what I want to focus on with you today. Instead, I want to look at and examine the 30 years, the 30 years of exile, the 30 years of being in the political desert where no one paid attention to him, where he was ridiculed and laughed at. We get an insight into those 30 years in his diary on the night that he became prime minister in 1940. Here's what he said on that night. He wrote these words. I was conscious of a profound sense of relief. At last I had the authority to give directions over the whole scene. I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial that all my past life was a preparation for this hour and for this trial. I believe that we can look at this season in the same way. That in fact, there's going to be a day, in fact, there's going to be a time when we're going to look back and say, you know, it was that, that era of the coronavirus pandemic. That's when I learned to be stronger. That's when I learned to rely on God more. That's when I, I realized that he had a plan and he had a timeline and it got me ready for the crisis I'm facing today. It got me ready for the trouble that I'm dealing with right now. Oh, you might not see it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but I really believe there'll be a time when we'll look back and we'll see this desert season as a time when God got us ready to maybe do something great for him in a trying time. And so what do we do now? How do we deal with it? How do we handle this time of the coronavirus? Well, it seems to me we do what Moses did in the book of Exodus in chapter 14 in particular. At this point in Exodus chapter 14, the children of Israel have been set free from captivity in Egypt. They have been set free from the hand of the Pharaoh. God had promised them a promised land, a land of milk and honey, a great promise. They were on their way to the promised land, but it took longer and it was harder walking and marching through the desert year after year to find this promised land. They, they grew discouraged. 
They started to criticize God and Moses. They would say, you know, we were better off as slaves in Egypt than to be stuck out here in the desert. And they were very judgmental. They thought they knew what God ought to do. They thought they knew what God should do. And they knew that he must have, should have done it in a lot different time level, time schedule. But Moses tells them that they need to be courageous and they need to look towards God's redemption and that God would satisfy them and meet their need. And then he says in verse 14, these words. In verse 14, he says to them in the midst of their criticism, he says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to keep still. The Lord will fight for you and you only have to keep still. That's what we should be doing. Realizing the Lord will fight for us. We can be still, we can wait on him. He's not gonna abandon us, he's going to see us through. So let us not be like those people on Palm Sunday who thought they knew more, who thought they knew what God should do and what God ought to do and thought that his time schedule was off. Let us be the people God is calling us to be, knowing that the almighty everlasting God really has a plan. He's bringing it to bear and he has a timeline and a time schedule and he's never late. Look to him, trust him. That's what Moses said to the children of Israel. Trust him and just be still. Let us pray together today. Lord, we thank you that we can do this. We can trust you and be still and know that you're going to be faithful. You've never let us down. You've always kept your word. And Lord, we ask you to do it again. Calm our hearts, calm our fears. Remind us that you really are in command and in control. And so Lord, help us to see in this desert season, your hand working in our lives to strengthen us, to make us different people, to get us ready for the future. Oh Lord, we thank you that you love us this much, that you would walk with us through this time. You didn't create it, but you're gonna see us through. Help us, Lord, to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and keep you in his grace. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the love of God, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, 
be with you all. Amen.